if we don't have an autophagy machinery that's actually functional, uh, then which does happen with age, then uh, we have extreme difficulty getting rid of these uh, these proteins, which ultimately lead to toxicity within the cell. It's the predominant way of thinking about autophagy is just to look at it as uh, you have to fast, therefore you'll maximize your autophagy, therefore it is always good. And that's that's definitely not the case. It's not an on and off switch. You're, you constantly have autophagy running throughout your cells. For sure, exercise stimulates autophagy. Cancer can have uh, devastating effects from an autophagy standpoint. Today, we're going to take an in-depth look at autophagy. Our guest is Nicholas Verhoeven. He's the host of the Physionic YouTube channel, and he's also a full-time scientist doing his PhD research. Among other topics, Nicholas has conducted and published research in the field of autophagy. He has created a number of videos on autophagy and fasting and many other health topics, and his content is very evidence-based without the hype that we often see on social media. So I think this is exactly what we all need more of, and I highly recommend checking out his channel. We talked about triggers of autophagy, so actual behaviors that induce autophagy and also things that suppress it, the timing of autophagy, so how long we need to do something in order for autophagy to be induced, what is actually known in humans as opposed to lab animals, and also how autophagy relates to conditions like cancer, aging, and many others. So here's our conversation. Enjoy. Autophagy is many different things, but uh, people most often claim it to be a cellular self-cleaning system. Um, but as I mentioned, autophagy is so many more things, but we'll we'll stick to kind of the, the common way of, of looking at it. Uh, so you have, your cells have three main systems of essentially deleting proteins, destroying proteins and, and different components within the cell. One is through what's known as like proteolytic cleavage. They essentially, an enzyme will come up to another protein that's maybe dysfunctional or that needs to be uh, altered in some way and will literally just cut it at a particular site and break it into two. And then it'll continue being broken up into different sections. Um, the other method is through what's called proteasome degradation. It looks much like a tube different proteins that are designated to be destroyed to get tagged by what's known as ubiquitin tags. And these proteins then get localized to or kind of chaperoned to the proteasome and the proteasome then sucks up this protein through the top and then essentially cuts it all up, degrades it and spits out, out of the bottom of this can, out of this tube, uh, the amino acids or the constituent parts that make up that protein. And then there's uh, autophagy, which is a far more macromolecule system, which can degrade particular single proteins, but also can degrade entire organelles. So think of it like this massive vacuum cleaner that wraps its arms around an organelle, if that's the mitochondria, if that's peroxisomes, if that's endoplasmic reticulum, it doesn't matter, any, any organelle. But as I mentioned, it does so many other things. It can actually attack bacteria. Uh, it can affect, uh, it can allow the cell to break down glucose molecules more efficiently. Uh, it can break down lipid molecules. There's all kinds of different things that it does, but essentially it takes the structures and breaks them down into simpler components. That's, that's the easiest way to understand uh, autophagy. Mm -hmm. As you were talking, it dawned on me how amazing it is that these processes, both the proteasome and autophagy, are such basic cellular processes that have, I mean, far precede our species. And yet they're relatively recent scientific advances to figure this out. Um, so the Nobel Prize for, for the ubiquitin came out when I was in grad school, like in the 2000s. And then for, for autophagy is even more recent and I remember when I was in grad school and this was being actively figured out, the whole autophagy story. It's amazing that it's uh, it's it's been it's taken relatively long scientifically to 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 discover these things that's that have been there all along. Mm -hmm.
So the induction of autophagy occurs through a number of different mechanisms, but people often attribute it to, well, I guess if you were to talk about like actual habits, people talk about fasting being a big one, exercise, that's another one. But really, when you're getting into the cellular, you're specifically triggering particular super proteins, or what I, I like to call the master proteins, because they have such distinct effects across the entire cell. Um, as a matter of fact, before we were recording, you were talking about mTOR a little bit, which is one of these master proteins. And the other one that's kind of like its uh, evil sibling is uh, AMPK. So you have these, these two proteins that are essentially master proteins because they have their ability to affect a host of different other cellular signals within the cell. And AMPK is this huge one that has tremendous effect and is probably the main regulator of autophagy. So when you're thinking about turning it on, uh, fasting can have a direct effect on uh, AMPK or the activation of AMPK and then therefore downstream activation of uh, of of autophagy and exercise as well can have uh, tremendous effects through, again, the same system. So through the activation of uh, AMPK. So I think those are probably the two biggest ones, but there are other ways as well. Yeah, well, we're going to get into some of the details because I, I actually got a ton of questions from viewers in terms okay. of timing timing and intensity and switching it on, switch, switching it off, all kinds of uh, all kinds of questions. People were super interested in, in those topics. For exercise, do we know if it's specific type of exercise is more effective, if it's cardio or weights or HIIT or badminton, I don't know. Is, is there something that's better as turning on autophagy? So on, to be completely honest, I mean, like you were, you were just saying that, you know, the Nobel Prize for autophagy was just awarded in 2016. And the research has been building up and ramping up significantly. We, I mean, there, there are so many studies on autophagy, but just like with anything else, we need hundreds and hundreds more to really get that granularity. And so the research has been focused on how does autophagy work? Then they're going out one layer further and they're saying, okay, well, how can we stimulate autophagy? And they keep going out and out and out. The exercise portions and the actual application parts are all the way out here. So there's a few studies that have looked at exercise, but in terms of actually getting granularity on okay, we're going to be looking at cardio exercise versus resistance training. That We just don't have that granularity. But what I can say is for sure, exercise stimulates autophagy. What they showed is that if people continue to exercise for three weeks, they had basal levels of autophagy that were higher than what they were previously. And that was the type of exercise that they did there was a biking. And they did try three different intensities and they found no difference between the three intensities. So now ask me that again in five years. The answer might, will probably have a lot more uh, granularity. Mm -hmm. Another question in terms of, you mentioned, you mentioned fasting. And one thing that I've seen in some of these reviews is this distinction between fasting and caloric restriction. So just eating less calories. And I've seen some suggestions that both can increase autophagy. Have you, have you seen that? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, for sure, fasting does, but for sure, caloric restriction does as well. But I think, again, getting that granularity of exactly how much of an effect in particular populations is going to vary. Yeah, that makes sense that it's context dependent. I also was looking into this recently, and I think it's this is a common idea on, on social media, that fasting is the only way that you can increase autophagy or, or the way that you can do it. And and if you want autophagy, you have to fast. But I've actually found numerous examples of, of triggers of, of autophagy. And another interesting thing is that some things are positive events or activities, and some are not health promoting at all, mm -hmm. which is another kind of uh, mindset shift. So we've talked about fasting and caloric restriction and exercise. Uh, I saw some in some reviews that infections, you talked about autophagy being one way to process bacteria. So infections can increase autophagy from what I've seen. Smoking can, oxidative stress can. So to me, I always felt that this idea that autophagy is always good and it's just this one-to-one -one fast autophagy and we just want to crank it up, the more the merrier. 
anytime you hear an idea that simplistic on social media, it's almost a guarantee that it, the real story is more complicated than that. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, I don't know if you have any any thoughts on all that. Yeah, definitely. Uh, it's something I've been railing against more and more <laughs> in in my content, to be honest with you, because you you I, you nailed it on the head. It's so true that there's so many. It's it's the predominant way of thinking about autophagy is just to look at it as uh, you have to fast, therefore you'll maximize your autophagy, therefore it is always good. And that's that's definitely not the case. I mean, one, there are definitely multiple triggers of autophagy. Um, two, you don't always want to massively increase autophagy. And uh, there are many instances where autophagy being upregulated is incredibly negative, <laughs> incredibly, which a chief example, and you gave uh, several as well, a uh, chief example of that would be uh, cancer. There are certain cancers that use autophagy to their advantage to survive the inside of the tumor will actually sometimes get deprived of oxygen. And autophagy can be used in that situation to actually eliminate sections of the cell that aren't necessary for the cell to function. So the tumor, the, the actual cells in that region start to essentially catabolize themselves so that a cancer cell can actually survive. So that's just one example where uh, cancer <laughs> cancer can have uh, devastating effects from an autophagy standpoint. That's a, a better example because I, uh, just to clarify for people listening, when I said that smoking, for example, induces autophagy, I wasn't suggesting that autophagy is mediating the harm of smoking or anything like that. If I had to guess, it's probably upregulated to deal with the oxidative stress. So in that context, the autophagy might actually be providing some some relief. Um, mm. But your example is better. There are there are examples where autophagy may actually be causing harm in specific contexts uh, in these these contexts of, of cancer where it may be countering cell death and uh, and working against what we want to happen in the context of a tumor genesis. Uh, but if I'm if I'm correct about this, even within cancer, it varies, right? Depending on the type of cancer, sometimes it's thought to be positive and sometimes it's thought to be negative to increase the levels of autophagy. That's yeah, that's that's absolutely true. I looked up one uh, BRAF mutation cancers tend to have uh, higher levels of autophagy, and now they're actually starting to experiment with uh, using autophagy inhibitors to try to because so so for these BRAF cancers, from what I've read, is that uh, they they'll they'll identify the cancer, they'll use a specific type of chemotherapy on it, and it seems to be very effective, and then it loses its effectiveness, and it seems to track quite well with autophagy. And what they found in the lab from isolated cells is that if they in inhibit autophagy, then they can actually the chemotherapy becomes far more effective. And what they think is happening is the autophagy is going in and actually eliminating some of the drugs that are being used against that that cancer cell. So if there is a way that they can actually inhibit the the uh, autophagy, then they're able to kill off the cell uh, more effectively. Yeah, so that the autophagy wouldn't rescue these cells from the uh, yeah. from the killing that we're trying to do, right? Yeah, I think I mean not to not to make people pull their hair out, but that we're just trying to to give a sense that things are oftentimes not as simple as a lot of social media content may may suggest, and and so it's worth considering these things. And at the end of the day, I think this all comes down to looking at actual health effects, actual net health health effects, and always taking these, the biochemistry and the cellular pathways with a grain of salt. It's not that those things don't matter. They do matter, but not losing track of big picture. And I mean, I see a lot of this, this content out there and a lot of people asking me in the comments, how do I increase my autophagy? Does this food increase autophagy? Does that thing increase autophagy? And and I think it loses a little bit of the, the, you know, the grand scheme when we are so obsessed with a with a biochemical pathway or, or a cellular process. I mean, the same behavior could increase autophagy and do 10,000 other things that are negative and the net effect could be negative and you don't want to do it just because autophagy goes up and vice versa. Something could be great, very health promoting and not change aut autophagy at all. So uh, I think just just having this, always bearing this, this in mind that the, the big picture, these these small pieces got kind of fit into that, but they don't replace it. Yeah, uh, actually, uh, real quick on that, 
I, you just struck a, a memory in, in my head about exercise, actually, in relation to autophagy. I read a v- review where they were talking about how exercise has this incredible mediating effect on autophagy, where specifically in studies where they showed low levels of autophagy that shouldn't be so low. So compared to a regular healthy control, they ended up using exercise and the autophagy levels then increased back to normal. However, they also did the opposite where they had uh, artificially high autophagy and they used exercise and actually lowered the autophagy debt back down to a basal level, which I thought that was super, super cool. And it 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 gives a little, I think it gives, to, to me, it gives a little bit of credence to the idea that sometimes using the real keep it simple, stupid mentality of just do the, the basics. And often that will kind of ameliorate a lot of the problems that, that people experience, you know, just in general, not even just talking about autophagy. Yeah, I think it's it's good to, to delve into the, all these things and look at the details and learn more and be curious. I think we should just shouldn't forget at the end of all this to to pull to zoom out and ask, okay, what's the health effect of this thing? Um, with or without autophagy. A lot of people asked about timing. How long do I need to fast for autophagy to be induced? Do we know first of all, I don't correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think it's it's this on and off switch. Uh, I think there's always a level of autophagy present at any point, any time, but there certainly is an increase in with fasting. Do we know what the time frame is for that? So there were several intermittent fasting studies that use 17 to about 19 hours of fasting, and it was usually early time restricted feeding, meaning that they consumed all their meals within you know eight hours or something like that in the morning, maybe a little bit into the afternoon, and then they didn't consume anything after that for the rest of the day overnight. Then they had measures taken the next morning, so that's after the full you know 18 hours or 17 hours. And they found that uh, for certain gene expression of particular autophagy uh, mediators or proteins, those were increased. Um, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to get overly scientific with this kind of stuff, but, you know, looking at gene expression alone, I'm sure you already know this, but looking at gene expression alone isn't a, a great metric for what might actually be happening within the cell because you're looking at the very first layer of What's happening, you know, you have to have gene expression, then you have to have actually the, the production of the mRNA, then looking at the protein expression, then what does the protein do? It's just a bunch of different things. So I, I would say that we need a lot more data on the topic, but preliminarily we can say that uh, there's a little bit of data pointing to, yes, intermittent fasting may increase autophagy slightly during the fasting window, at the very end of the fasting window. Um, now, the next question then is, is it because of caloric restriction or is it because of the actual fasting itself? I don't think that we have enough data on that. I think the studies that I was able to tease out, they kept the the calories roughly the same. So the control was uh, the same individuals, except uh, they consumed uh, morning yeah, more uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So they didn't have this fasting period except for when they were asleep. And of course, they didn't see an increase in autophagy. So it, could it be could it be less than that? Could it be 14 hours? Could it be 20 hours that you really see this this ramp up of autophagy? And to your point, it's not a it's not an on and off switch. You you constantly have autophagy running throughout your cells. There's some studies. So I did find one that did 72 hours water fasting, and they did see some robust changes in in a very common autophagy protein. So that was to me more convincing because uh, it's it's probably the best, if not the second best measure of autophagy that we have. Um, and they did they did show some robust uh, effects in that. But you know, since we're talking about 17 hours, in terms of 17 to 18 hour data, I don't think that there's a whole lot of great data other than some gene expression data. Yeah, I've got I've got two studies right in front of me. Both of them did one did 17 to 19 hours, one did 18 hours. Both of them did gene expression data. Yeah, so it's just suggestive. And then mm. the other study is more compelling, but that's like three days of, of water yeah. fasting. Exactly. Yeah. Gotcha. Granularity-wise, we don't know if it keeps going up and up or if it plateaus. We don't know any of that. 
Well, I mean, I, uh, I hope it plateaus. <laughs> I mean, imagine if it just keeps going, 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 and then it never stops. I mean, we'll all end up dead. So yeah, I, I would I would say with some pretty good uh, firm basis that it's going to plateau at some point, but what that point is, I have no idea. I had wondered, and you, you kind of already answered this, or at least you touched on it, um, that if autophagy is increased when we fast, if there is no reduction in calories, so let's say we're eating the same meals, but at different times, and I'm fasting longer, I'm, I'm crunching my meals into earlier in the day, right? And you're eating the same meals, but, but spacing them out. Uh, am I going to experience more autophagy overall? Because you're still, yeah, I, I, it's not clear to me that overall there's going to be an increase in autophagy, like say area under the curve. Mm. There might be an increase in autophagy at a certain time point. My autophagy metrics might be higher than yours, but overall, is there a is there an increase? Yeah, I, the answer is I have no idea. I don't think anybody does because to your point, the area under the curve is one of my favorite metrics, and it's it's definitely not been quantified, at least based off the studies that I've found, which are like four or five. Mm -hmm. They they've all looked at a single time point, you know, just like let's measure here and let's measure this other time as well. My impression of the, the, the things I hear about autophagy on social media is that a lot of these more sensational claims are all coming from rodent data. But correct me if that's not right, because um, all this stuff about autophagy being the key for the benefits of fasting, autophagy and lifespan extension, that's coming from model organisms, as, as far as I know, not even mice, as far as I know, it's nematodes, so these little worms. And like I was saying before we started recording, we, we did some of those experiments in grad school with uh, fruit flies and tried to replicate that. And it, it didn't even work at that level. Uh, so, uh, I mean, to say that this works in humans is such a massive logical leap. But yeah, is, is that am I right in saying, in, in thinking that most of these ideas are, are coming from animal research or are there exceptions? Uh, no, I think you're absolutely right. Okay. Um, <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't rule out that these things might happen in humans in the future It's just TBD. And I think it's just, we have to be careful with the hype and the, these claims mm -hmm. and for people listening, it's not even that hard to, to fact check this. When you hear one of these sensational claims, autophagy extends your lifespan or autophagy, you know, whatever it is, does this to you. Just ask for the evidence. You, know, you don't need seven PhDs. Just ask, okay, can you give me a link to a study that shows that? And you can tell from the title often if this is a mouse study, if this is a cell culture study, if this is a human study. And we don't dismiss evidence in mice. Uh, both of us, I think a lot of our research output has been in the mechanistic realm. So we're definitely not biased against it. But I think we're comfortable with what it can and cannot tell us and not making these, these massive leaps. So yeah, just ask for the evidence and take a quick look. You don't even need to, to go through the minutiae of these studies. Like you can tell from the abstract, the little summary, you can tell often from the title what kind of research it is. And if somebody is telling you, go do this because this will definitely happen to you, and it's they're showing you a, re a study in, in rats, that at least gives you pause, right? ask, okay, this is interesting. This happens in a rat. Is there any evidence in humans going in the same direction? Just just get used to asking these questions, be inquisitive. We are kind of asking these questions in terms of what does it do in humans? What is the actual relevance? What is the actual data? When I pose these questions, I've had viewers uh, ask me things like, so are you saying autophagy isn't real? Um, or another one, another common one is, well, they got the Nobel Prize for it, so why are you even questioning the importance? We're not saying that it's not real, and we're not saying it's not a relevant, a fundamental cellular process. We're just saying that in order to make claims about the outcomes in humans of inducing autophagy with this or that method, we need evidence showing that. We can't jump from cells in a Petri dish or, or a rodent in a cage. That's all good. It's it's all suggestive and hypothesis generating, but uh, we need more. 
a lot of people ask, can I, is there a way for me to measure my autophagy? Is there an autophagy assay? Uh, the answer is yes, but uh, it's not going to be available to people. <laughs> so <laughs> the, the the answer is if you've got a Bergstrom needle and you're ready to inject yourself with a, with a needle and rip some some muscle tissue out, then yeah, you could absolutely measure it. Um, in in all reality, like the, you have to have there's there's a number of problems, but there's also a number of solutions. So I'm going to offer some problems. I'm going to offer some solutions. Um, the the issue is that we think of autophagy as like, okay, is it on or is it off? Okay. So we've already addressed that it's a dimmer switch, but the other aspect is each tissue has its own level of autophagy. So if you look at your muscle tissue compared to your liver tissue, compared to your brain, there are different levels of autophagy and they get induced at different times. So we can't take a muscle measurement and then just assume that it's going to apply to the rest of the body. So one there there's, there's that problem. Um, the other aspect is that, yeah, we could easily develop an assay. And I would not be shocked at all if in the future we did develop an assay that actually allowed us to, just like a blood draw, we'd be able to, to draw blood and then be able to test it in immune cells, for example. We would not be able to test it in red blood cells because red blood cells uh, don't have organelles. So they undergo autophagy at initial stages, but not uh, later on. So if we do take uh, measurements of immune cells, so if it's possible to, to grab some of those immune cells and then measure autophagy within those, that'd be great. But again, that, that wouldn't actually translate to, am I developing autophagy in my kidneys, for example, if I have renal disease or something like that? You would actually have to have a tissue sample of that, that tissue. This is all in the research setting, right? Is there any mm -hmm. assay being sold to the public by these, by these startups? Is there anything like that? No, that I have no idea. I mean, it's possible somebody's doing it. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if they make a good amount of money doing it. But if it if it actually ends up uh, measuring and being of any value is is a completely different story. Mm -hmm. I mean, you mentioned this before, but a lot of the the research that's been done in aging and longevity in relation to autophagy, like there have been these claims of uh, greater autophagy. Uh, leads to longer life. And that's true for certain research, but that research is not in humans, obviously. Um, there is, as we age, our capacity for autophagy decreases. And that's one of the reasons why we have this buildup of misfolded proteins and mistargeted proteins, things of that nature. So our cells are constantly generating millions and millions of these different proteins, enzymes that fulfill different functions. And autophagy is necessary to eliminate any sort of dysfunctional cellular proteins. And we start to accrue those cellular proteins. And if we don't have an autophagy machinery that's actually functional, uh, then which does happen with age, then uh, we have extreme difficulty getting rid of these uh, these proteins, which ultimately lead to toxicity within the cell. And the cell in general just stops functioning nearly as well. So it ultimately usually ends up either going into senescence or it ends up going into uh, apoptosis, which is cell death, programmed cell death. And there are a number of different reasons why that happens. So one is just the burden of oxidative stress over time. Um, we start to affect the genes, the autophagy genes, of course, all the other genes as well, but the autophagy genes. Another thing is that oxidative stress can actually, so when we go through autophagy, we have these different uh, vesicles that have that, let's say, well, let's talk about the end stages of autophagy. Autoph the autophagy machinery has already captured all the proteins that it wants to destroy. They're all stuck within this vesicle, but they that doesn't actually do anything. What actually has to happen is another vessel comes in called a lysosome and binds with the vacuole or that, that vessel that contains all the proteins and essentially discharges a bunch of enzymes and uh, a, a much lower pH, so an acidic environment that ultimately ends up degrading those, those, those proteins. Unfortunately, as we age with the oxidative stress, uh, we can start to experience damage to the lysosomes as well, so that they are, become a lot more alkaline. So they uh, lose some of their acidic potential so that when they fuse with the autophagosome, it doesn't actually de uh, destroy all those, uh, those, pr those proteins. So 
you know, there's, there's a number of different mechanisms. I'm, I'm only describing one or two, but there's many different mechanisms by which over time we start to lose that ability to, to undergo uh, autophagy. Mm -hmm. So it goes down with age. It's possible that rescuing that could have a benefit uh, either lifespan wise or kind of a uh, health span wise. Um, mm -hmm. But demonstrating that as, as always is kind of tough. I mean, doable, but tough would require clinical trials in probably older population with some agent that um, rescues these, these processes. Yeah. Uh, and exercise for sure is one of these major ones. It can be preventative in the first place, but it can also bolster autophagy. What I think from exercise, one of the, the kind of side benefits of it is that it also increases glutathione. It increases all these different antioxidant capacities. So if you think about the overall burden of oxidative stress over time, and you're lessening that over time continuously, you're also going to be uh, maintaining not just autophagy, but you're going to be maintaining the rest of the health of the cell as well. adverse effect on muscle mass, people worried about losing their gains. What's the word on that? The answer is probably not. I mean, again, we can look at it from both of those perspectives I was talking about earlier, where you can look at it from a high level perspective. If you're doing exercise or fasting, of course, if you're fasting for 72 hours, eventually you start to see some loss of, of muscle, but it's still not that extreme. Um, if you're in a calorie deficit and you're not supplementing that with exercise, specifically resistance training, then yes, you can eventually maybe down the road lose a little bit of muscle mass. But if you're doing exercise and stimulating autophagy, are you then losing muscle? Highly, highly unlikely. I think that, again, people get so focused on autophagy and the fact that autophagy has to have these very, usually in most forms of autophagy have to have these specific targeting sequences. So it's not like autophagy just gets born and it just gets multiplied. And these things are just sucking everything up and killing everything in your cells. I mean, they, it's all very controlled. Um, you have to have this ubiquitination process. You have to have many different proteins that have to come together. Um, so it's, it's highly unlikely to me that specifically autophagy is going to suddenly make a person lose all their gains. As a matter of fact, you know, probably a more muscular person or a person with just better cardio uh, fitness probably has higher levels of autophagy in the first place. And they tend to function better, tend to be stronger, et cetera, et cetera. So quick summary of everything we've covered. Autophagy is a fundamental cellular process. And it's induced in many different contexts, especially cell stress, like, for example, situations of starvation or nutrient deprivation, as well as insults like infections or oxidative stress. And exercise can also induce it if practiced regularly. So one study that Nicholas brought up measured autophagy acutely right after exercise and chronically after three weeks of exercising regularly. Acutely, the evidence was mixed. There was no significant increase in autophagy markers. And then chronically, after three weeks of consistent exercise, they did see a significant increase in gene expression of proteins involved in autophagy at rest. So people exercising had higher baseline, higher rest levels of autophagy than people in the control group, not doing the regular exercise. And these assays looking at gene expression are suggestive not perfect. We touched on some of the caveats of these measurements. So overall, there is enormous potential for research on autophagy. There's a lot of excitement around it as well. Autophagy probably does play a role in cancer, aging, and a number of other diseases as well. Sometimes it looks like autophagy is helping and we might want more of it. Other times it might actually be getting in the way and we might want to suppress it. So it's very context specific. There are many open questions and areas of active research, especially when it comes to humans. For example, it's possible that autophagy mediates some of the benefits of exercise. It's just really hard to demonstrate that in human beings. The main takeaway from all of this for me is that the best strategy we've got is to focus on behaviors that have been shown to be health promoting, whether they induce autophagy or not. Here's some more detailed information on fasting, and here's more on exercise, specifically the best workout to lower your glucose levels. Check those out. I'll meet you over there.